Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm the Director of Portfolio Management at TRICOM. As an administrative and financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, TRICOM was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Lauren Grizzy with Assurance. Lauren is a safety supervisor at Assurance with 10 years of industry experience. An expert in the staffing industry, she works closely with her clients to establish effective safety programs that achieve measurable results. Lauren takes a personalized approach when working with her clients to form valuable relationships that allow her to serve as a trusted advocate. She understands that the staffing industry is a fast-placed industry and strives to achieve customized practical solutions that provide an overall program that is easy to manage. Assurance is among the largest and most awarded independent insurance brokerages in the United States. Top 50 broker and repeated national best place to work winner, Assurance creates value by minimizing risk and maximizing health for more than 600 staffing companies across the country. The company is headquartered in Schaumburg, Illinois, with centralized office locations in Chicago, Illinois, and St. Louis, Missouri. At the end of 2016, the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational and Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, began enforcing a new standard that requires electronic reporting of accident information and changes to current policies that could inadvertently deter injury reporting. Policies affected by these changes include discipline, incentive programs, and post-accident drug testing. In today's edition of the Industry Insider, Lauren will cover overview of the changes, how the changes apply to staffing agencies, and what you can do to remain compliant. By the end of this session, you'll know how to apply these policy changes to improve workplace safety for your placements. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please welcome Lauren. Thanks so much, Amanda, and thanks everybody else for joining for this webinar on OSHA's electronic reporting and anti-retaliation changes for staffing. A little bit about what I plan to cover today with you all. Uh, just a little bit of background about these changes. When did this start? When did they become effective? Uh, what was really the process to get these in place? Then we'll go over what the new requirements are specifically for injury reporting, and then on the injury reporting deterrence. So as part of these changes, as Amanda mentioned, there were some different guidelines based on post-accident drug testing, incentive programs, and discipline policies. So we'll cover each of those individually, and then we'll wrap up with a quick Q&A session. So just to get started with the background. So this new rule was proposed in 2013. For anybody particularly familiar with OSHA, nothing really happens quickly when it comes to making changes to the federal regulations. But so this particular change started, was proposed back in 2013. In 2014, they held a public meeting to get feedback from the public at large about these changes. And after those comments were received, they published the final rule in May 2016. Now, when they published the rule in May 2016, it was said that all of these items will become effective as of August 11th, and that was the original deadline. However, there was a court case in Texas that was against some of the changes that were part of this rule. And because of that, they ended up pushing back the effective dates. So the original was August 11th. It was pushed back then to November 1st. Uh, with the case still pending, it was pushed again to December 1st. Now, finally, around November, a judge in Texas had ruled that even though the court case was pending, that the rules would still be able to be enforced moving forward. And then, of course, if there's any changes pending the result of that court case, then they'll make that adjustment at that time. 
So all of the rules that we're going to talk about today actually were effective December 1st. Since that initial court case, there have actually been a few more court cases that have come up, again, with issues about these particular changes, but again, the rules are still enforced now. So why the, why the change in the first place? Prior to this new rule, OSHA did not have direct access to OSHA log and recordable injury information. There are methods in place for them to access some of this information, but more on a random scale. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics will send out surveys every year to companies in different industries to come up with industry averages for injuries. However, that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics that's getting that information. So OSHA can get the bulk information, which is the same thing that's available to us as the public, but they weren't able to see for a specific company who was having a larger amount of injuries than others. So the only time OSHA would really see a company's OSHA log would be if they were on site during an investigation. In their publication of the rule, they have said that they believe that being able to collect this information directly would serve a few purposes. Um, allocation of compliance assistance, so which companies need more help from compliance officers, which companies need visited more often, uh, nudging employers to reduce injuries for public perception. It's been said that this is almost a public shaming because part of this rule is that the injury information will be publicly available, but for staffing, this actually turns out to be the big benefit, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, more of an opportunity for benchmarking for industry averages. And then public health researchers can use this information to determine where more research needs to be done on specific injury causation. Now, an overview of the electronic reporting changes, which is really the first half of this rule. The actual record keeping process is not changing. So for anyone familiar with OSHA record keeping and OSHA logs, uh, normally for temporary staffing, you do not need to keep a log for injuries that happen to your temporary employees, and that does not change. Whoever's providing the day-to-day -day supervision and actually directing the work and products, methods, processes, that's who has to keep the log. So in 99% of cases, it's gonna be your host client or your host employer. And this is gonna be the same moving forward. That doesn't change at all. Uh, you do still need to, what I find some staffing companies don't know is that you do still need to maintain an OSHA log for your internal staff, assuming that you have 10 or more employees total. Normally, those logs are going to be blank because you don't necessarily see a lot of injuries to uh, sales personnel or recruiters, but it's still required that you do have a log. The two changes of the regulation actually effective for record keeping is that now, rather than just keeping the OSHA logs and having them to yourself, companies will need to actually submit this data to OSHA on an annual basis, and the data will be publicly available on OSHA's website. Now, as I mentioned, that. The electronic reporting had a benefit to staffing, and that's really what that is. So whereas now, uh, staffing companies hopefully all know that you are able to go on OSHA's website and look up a specific company to see if they've had previous OSHA citations, what those citations were for, when the inspection was, when they were corrected, what the penalty was. And that information can be really helpful in determining uh, specific focus items when you're going out to a client or a prospect. Now, with this change, their injury information will also be available publicly on OSHA's website. So rather than having to ask a prospect or a client for their OSHA log, you would be able to go on to OSHA's website and actually pull that information up, assuming that they're one of the companies that are required to submit them. There's going to be two different groups of requirements for who actually has to submit these logs. Um, one for 250 or more employees at one location, and one for locations with 20 to 249 in high-risk industries. And we'll go over the different requirements for each. So for companies with 250 plus employees, they will need to report on an annual basis. The first deadline is gonna be July 1st, 2017, and at which time they'll have to submit their 300A form, which is just the summary form, the one that's normally required to be posted between February 1st and April 30th every year. It doesn't give you any information about exactly what happened with the injury, but it just serves as an overall summary of how many cases they had, how many were days away from work, how many were job transfer restriction or medical treatment only. After this year, next year by July 1st, 2018, anybody with 250 or more employees will have to submit their 300A form along with the log in any corresponding 301 forms, which is essentially an incident report. So 
So it'll be really everything that they're required to maintain per the record keeping standard, they will have to submit all of that information to OSHA by July 1st, 2018. The year after the deadline will be moved up to March 2nd. And then again, it'll be the same information that they have to submit all of the OSHA forms from the previous year. And then every year, what they submit will be the same and the deadline will remain as 3-2. For the first two years, OSHA gave a little bit of leeway to move that to July 1st. But after that, it'll move to March 2nd since the OSHA logs for the previous year should be completed and wrapped up by that February 1st deadline anyway when the 300A form is required to be posted. Now for companies with 20 to 249 employees in high risk industries, which we'll go over what's a high risk industry in a minute, they will also need to report on an annual basis. Uh, Deadlines are the same, 7-1 for the first two years, and then 3-2 for every year after that. The big difference is for these companies or these industries, they will only have to report that 300A summary form data. So they won't need to actually submit their OSHA log and all of their incident report forms. They will just need to submit that summary to OSHA on an annual basis. Now, as far as what is a high risk, uh, the list that was released was considered an all-inclusive, but a remarkable amount of industries, a lot that you would see <clears throat> companies working with, with staffing agencies, are on this particular list. This is not the entire list, but this is just an example of some of the industries that are included. The one notable item is that um, manufacturing as a whole is on here. So the list that OSHA put out is based on NAICS code, so the North American Classification System. Now, in this case, um, by using codes 31 through 33, essentially any company that manufactures anything is going to fall under that high-risk industry. So if you have any clients that fall under manufacturing, they will be required to report that data. Warehousing and storage is also on here, uh, medical facilities, nursing care facilities, uh, services to buildings and dwellings normally includes custodial workers. So just a few examples of some of those industries that we'll have to report moving forward this year. If you're going to have to report, uh, there's going to be three options to do so. You'll either be able to manually enter that data, upload it from Excel, or transmit it electronically from your record keeping or HR system. Now, a lot of cases, staffing companies are not going to have to report uh, because either A, you don't have a location with 250 more employees. Again, talking to your internal staff, not your temporary employees. And B, you don't, staffing isn't one of the industries that was listed on that high risk, all inclusive list. So in most cases, you are not going to have to report. The injuries that happen to your temporary workers should be on your client's log. So when they're reporting to OSHA, the injuries from your temp employees should be on their log and should be reported as part of that submission. If you're currently keeping logs separately from your clients, it may be a good time to have that conversation with them to make sure that they understand that they have to submit everything together. The website to submit was supposed to be live in February. So when this information was released uh, late December last year, they had said that by February, the website would be up and running for everyone to start submitting that data. However, as of probably two days ago, the information, that website is still not up and running. So the, if you go to the website, it'll say that you don't have to report anything at this time, that it will be available. It'll have updates on their website. However, still not up. The deadline though is July 1st, and we're recommending that everyone wait till a little bit further to that July 1st deadline anyway, since there could be changes from now until then. So even though the website's not up and running, there's still time for that deadline. Also, when they release this information, they had mentioned that at some point they want to put a mobile app in place to report this data. Um, given that the actual website isn't up and running, I think the mobile apps probably are far ways out, but that is part of the goal in rolling out this change. So we only have questions about the electronic reporting changes. So establishment size, is that location or company as a whole? So for the electronic reporting piece, the establishment size is per location, not company-wide. So when we're talking about an establishment with 250 plus employees, we're talking at one specific facility. 
when you're looking at overall record keeping requirements, so if you have to maintain a log, as I mentioned earlier, so any company with 10 or more employees has to maintain an OSHA log, that's actually a company-wide requirement. But since OSHA logs are kept on a facility or a location basis, in this case, establishment is per location. Now that total size of employees is going to be determined based on peak employment during the last calendar year. So whatever the highest amount of employees was at that location, because it does include full-time, part-time, seasonal, and again, temporary workers. So if you have a client that has, you know, there's 300 employees total at the facility and 225 of them are yours, they easily fall over that 250 if you add theirs plus your employees. So you wanna make sure again that they're reporting that. As far as personal information, so on the OSHA 300 log, there is actual individual names for each injury. In those cases, um, that information is not going to be posted. Obviously, there are privacy guidelines in place for that sort of thing, and this information will be publicly available. So any personal information that is submitted to OSHA will be removed prior to posting it on the website. If you're not 250 plus and more employees at one location, and you don't fall into one of those high hazard industries with the 20 to 249 employees, you may still have to report electronically at some point, but it'll be more on a random basis. So as I mentioned, the Bureau of Labor Statistics now already does that where they choose companies randomly by industry. OSHA is reserving the right to be able to do that if there's a company that they would like to see the OSHA log data from, that they don't fall into one of those categories that are required to submit it, then they could still potentially request that information from you at some point. So the electronic reporting piece is really more of a benefit for, for staffing. Uh, it gives you a good in to start talking more with your clients again about making sure they're keeping their records correctly, that they're keeping your temp employees on their log. More importantly, it's going to give you easy access to that injury information so that you would actually be able to look that up. The piece that isn't so beneficial for staffing is going to be the injury reporting deterrence. Now, the injury reporting deterrence, there's three specific provisions. Uh, number one is that employees have to be informed of their right to report work-related injuries. Now, all this is easily met just by posting the OSHA poster, which in a lot of cases, if you have like the federal poster package or anything like that, you probably already have that included as it, as part of it. And they, OSHA had said as part of the guidelines that posting that poster meets that requirement to inform the employees. So that one's not particularly challenging. Uh, two, employer cannot retaliate against employees for reporting injuries. And three is really more of the questionable item. The employer's procedure for reporting injuries and illnesses can't deter or discourage employees from reporting. Now, in that particular provision, they focus on three specific common policies. Discipline, post-accident drug testing, and incentive programs. And we'll talk about each of those separately. Discipline policies. So when OSHA is looking at discipline policies that are potentially deterring injury reporting, they're more worried about situations where employees are being disciplined only for the fact that they reported an injury. Some examples that they provided as part of this guidance um, employees who report injuries being disciplined more severely than others who were also working the same way. So a good example of that would be if you have four employees that were all performing the same action, uh, which is against whatever the safety rule that's already in place, if one of them got injured and that was the only person that was disciplined for not working safely, then that could be seen as a deterrent or a way to discourage reporting. If all four employees were working in the same unsafe manner or were all breaking the same rule, even though the other three did not get injured, all four should be disciplined as part of that. Two, employees who report injuries um, being disciplined for vague reasons, such as they weren't working carefully enough or they weren't being safe enough. So you want to make sure that when you're wording why you're disciplining somebody, if they're being disciplined after an injury was reported and there doesn't seem to be a specific safety rule tied to it, OSHA said there's a possibility that you're just using that as a way to deter. Um, policies that make employees who report injuries ineligible for promotions and automatic poor performance evaluations for employees who report injuries. 
Now, discipline can still be given post-accident, so it's not necessarily saying that you can no longer discipline once an injury has occurred, but it has to follow two simple guidelines. That should be tied to a specific rule. So if the rule was that they were in an area that they're not authorized to be in, if they weren't wearing their personal protective equipment, you want to make sure that it's being tied to that specific rule that they broke that contributed to that potential accident. And then also, just as important, you want to make sure that the rule is being applied consistently to all employees. So if, let's say, going back to the lack of use of personal protective equipment, if you require safety glasses throughout the entire facility, but it's not enforced at all, and somebody who got injured wasn't wearing their safety glasses, you're going to have a hard time making the case that they weren't just disciplined because they were injured. If nobody's wearing it, nobody's enforcing it, then it's not necessarily a clear rule that's being followed by everyone. So you want to make sure that whatever rules you're disciplining for are going to be applied consistently. Now, for staffing, a lot of times that discipline is going to be coming from your client or the host employer. So as you see those discipline reports come in from them, you want to just make sure to take a peek and make sure that they're disciplining for something that is a clear rule and that hopefully, as you're getting these discipline forms, that it's something that's being consistent across the board, not just for those that were injured. The key to this is always going to be documentation. And really, with anything in regards to OSHA, documentation is going to be a huge part of it. Uh, the OSHA mantra is, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So if they were to come in and say, well, hey, is this actually consistently enforced, having that documentation to show that other people have been disciplined for it in cases where they weren't injured, is going to go a long way in the defense that it's not something that's being used as a deterrent for injury reporting. So as I mentioned, they have to be consistent and violation of specific rules. Uh, probably the most common that I would avoid, uh, work more carefully, be more safe, things like that, uh, because there isn't a specific, you can't monitor to see if someone's working more carefully than someone else or that someone's more aware than someone else. So you want to make sure that it's a specific violation that's being disciplined. For staffing, probably one of the discipline items that I see used most often for post-incident is going to be late reporting. And OSHA did address that as part of this guidance. Now, what they said was that discipline can still be issued for late reporting as long as it's practical. So the example that they gave as part of that was, um, let's say an employee is working on a Tuesday towards the end of the day, they feel a little bit of a tweak in their back, it's not so bad. Um, they go home, it gets worse, they report it first thing the next morning. To OSHA, even though it wasn't reported at the end of that shift or immediately, which I know is a lot of the written policies that are currently in place, because they reported it immediately the next morning upon realizing it was a problem, that's a practical time frame and disciplining them for late reporting would not be reasonable. Now, if the case was it was a Tuesday, someone tweaked their back at the end of the day, it started to hurt, to, it started to hurt Wednesday, and finally Friday morning they reported it to them, then that's an obvious case of late reporting, and you would be able to still discipline as part of that. So it's not necessarily that they gave a time frame or anything like that. I think probably your safest bet would be to look if it was within 24 hours of the actual incident happening, depending on what kind it is. Um, I know strains can sometimes take a little bit to develop. Something like a laceration is going to be much more immediate, so that you'd have a pretty clear time frame on what would be considered late reporting. But you just want to use your judgment as you're looking at those incidents coming in. And if you're going to issue discipline for that late reporting, think about whether or not would it be considered reasonable that they could have reported it before they did. The post-accident drug testing changes is really the most controversial piece of the new regulation. Those court cases I mentioned earlier on that are pending, uh, the original court case that was holding back the enforcement date of this was specific to the post-accident drug testing. Now, it doesn't necessarily ban post-accident drug testing, but it prohibits employers from using drug tests or the threat of drug testing as a way to deter injury reporting. So what OSHA believes should be done is that when an injury occurs, that specific injury should be looked at to see if whether or not drugs could have contributed to the accident. If it was a case where drugs could not have contributed or were very unlikely that it would have, then drug testing should not be done. 
the whole thought behind this being that post-accident drug testing isn't supposed to be used as a punishment or as a way to potentially terminate someone that's injured. The whole goal of post-accident drug testing is to help determine if drugs were a potential cause or contributing factor to that injury that occurred. So some examples they gave of unreasonable drug testing, uh, repetitive motion injuries, and insect bites are probably the two most obvious as well. If somebody was stung by a bee, likely it wasn't because they were on drugs. If they were on drugs, it wasn't a contributing factor. So giving a drug test for that type of incident would not be considered reasonable. Repetitive motion, similar concept. Uh, because repetitive motion is just from using the same particular muscle on an everyday basis, again, not something that drugs would potentially contribute to. Some clarifying items that OSHA did provide. Uh, drug use doesn't have to be suspected beforehand or before the injury or before testing it done. It just has to be a reasonable possibility that they contributed. So it doesn't necessarily, for people, that anyone who's familiar with reasonable suspicion testing, so as part of reasonable suspicion testing, a big chunk of that is, you know, identifying those factors or those behaviors in an employee where you can see that they could potentially be under the influence. Uh, this doesn't limit to that particular instance. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be that someone was stumbling or that their eyes were glossed over or something along those lines. It just has to be that once you have details of the injury or what happened, that it's possible that drug use could have been a part of that. Now, this regulation is separate of state work comp and federal laws. So if there are regulations in place that already require drug testing as part of them, then you would still be able to do testing. The most common example is going to be Department of Transportation. So for DOT drivers, so those with a commercial driver's license, as part of DOT requirements, if they are involved in an accident, they have to go to drug testing and that law is going to supersede these OSHA changes. So it doesn't necessarily have any effect on any of those laws that are already in place. The concept of not being able to do blanket drug testing is surprisingly not unheard of. There are states that already have similar restrictions in place by their state legislature. So some examples, uh, Connecticut, Oklahoma, Vermont, Rhode Island, all of these states already have similar laws in place that do limit the ability to drug testing so that it can't be done across the board. It has to be limited to certain situations. So this is not exactly something that no one's ever had to undergo before. For your current policies, the recommendation is just to make sure that if you have a written policy currently that says that post-accident drug testing is required for any incident, just to change the wording slightly to be post-accident drug testing will be required where drug use is a possible contributing factor. Again, you're not necessarily limiting it to any situation. You're just stating that it will be required if it's a case where drug use could have potentially contributed. Now, from there, cases should be looked at individually to determine if drugs could have contributed. For staffing, I know that depending on, obviously, how fast you get that report from your actual client, can make it a little bit trickier than others. Now, again, this drug testing regulation doesn't just apply to staffing. It probably is a little bit more challenging for staffing than other industries, but it applies across the board. So your clients should already be making this change where they're not necessarily doing drug testing across the board. They're only doing it on a specific case basis. If they're not, it may be good to talk to them a little bit about the regulation change, just so they know that this is something that is enforceable and is potentially punishable by citation as of December 1st of last year. For a reasonable suspicion training, um, it can be useful for supervisors or any other staff you have that are currently making that judgment call of whether or not drugs could have contributed, just because reasonable suspicion training can be helpful in determining what, those, what certain behavior characteristics are of people who are potentially under the influence, then having that as a backup. So if you were to ever be questioned by OSHA as to why you made the call you did, Having the documentation that you had done that to educate your staff could always be part of that defense. Of course, any policies put in place uh, specific to HR items or even sometimes safety should always be reviewed with your employment law counsel first. Some of the concern with the post-accident drug testing specifically with moving away from blanket testing is that now you're potentially looking at discrimination. 
So why did you choose one person rather than another? But again, that's why it's so important that you have a process in place of how you make that determination and hopefully that previous training on what to look for when they're making that call of whether or not drug testing should be done. Now, there are some companies that have gone away with, taken away with their post-accident drug testing altogether. Um, and I know some that have still kept with the blanket testing despite the regulation change. But again, you want to make sure you're looking at those cases on an individual basis. And a lot of cases, you probably would be able to make the case that drugs could have contributed, but it's important to have that process in place in case it were to ever come to OSHA's attention and you would have to go through an investigation as part of that. After the initial release of information, there was an additional guidance piece that was put out afterwards. Uh, some key takeaways from that additional guidance. Uh, the changes to the post-accident drug testing have no effect on pre-employment or random testing. So if whatever you're currently doing for screenings, whether it be by client request or across the board, uh, this doesn't change any of that. Uh, random drug test policies, so when you have either usually a, a third party or some other kind of system to randomly choose names of who to do drug tests for, again, this has no effect on that whatsoever. Testing for alcohol should only be limited to whether or not impairment could have been a factor. Uh, kind of the breakdown of that is alcohol is a drug which leaves your system particularly quickly. So if somebody reported an accident three days later, doing an alcohol test doesn't actually give you any information about whether or not alcohol contributed to the accident, which is the reason why you're doing the testing. So depending on the time frame after the accident when the testing is actually occurring, you want to make sure that you're limiting it just to what's going to help you determine that root cause or come up with another factor of that root cause analysis. Now, OSHA would like to do something similar with drug testing so that you would be able to limit depending on how, like, you know, how long the drugs have an actual effect on your system and how long they will impair the employee's judgment or behavior. However, there isn't enough data or research out at this point to come up with a specific time frame on when would be too late to drug test. So as of right now, they're just focusing on when alcohol testing is used. There are some examples where state work comp laws will supersede. So a couple of those, there are a few state drug-free workplace programs that require post-accident drug testing for premium reductions. Now, this is when you're with this actual state, insured by the state. In those cases, you would be able to continue. If your private insurance carrier provides a premium discount that's in line with the applicable state law, it would be the same thing. Then you would have, you wouldn't, that would supersede this new OSHA change and you would be able to keep drug testing across the board. There aren't that many states that have these laws in place, but it could potentially be a factor. Uh, the last guidance they had given, so if you are part of any kind of collective bargaining agreement, so if there is a union at any of the facilities that you have employees placed at and testing is required as part of that agreement, that is a case where it is not, um, it does not supersede OSHA. So you would have to either amend that collective bargaining agreement or be in violation of the OSHA rules you would not get a pass just because it's within the collective bargaining agreement. When actually examining these different scenarios and cases as OSHA is looking at individuals' programs, there's going to be three main factors that they're looking at. Number one, again, whether or not it's a reasonable possibility that drugs could have been a contributing factor and provide some kind of information or insight as to why that injury actually occurred. Two, uh, employees involved in the same incident or engaged in the same behavior were also tested whether or not they were injured. Or three, if there's a heightened entrance to determining drug use depending on the hazardness of the work. Uh, there is, so we mentioned some of those state, states that already have a program in place that limits drug testing post-accident. So Connecticut, for example, is one of those. And the way the Connecticut law is written is actually that drug testing can also, could only be done for safety-sensitive positions. And this phrase is used in a couple other state legislatures as well. And in this case, safety sensitive means it's a position where the safety and awareness of that particular employee is heightened just because of the hazardness of the work. Probably the most common example of this is going to be a forklift operator. So if there were a case where 
a forklift operator were to have injured another employee, of, say a pedestrian that was walking by, in that case, the injured employee actually shouldn't be tested. It should be the forklift operator that struck them, depending on the circumstances. But in most cases, that's going to be one of those safety sensitive positions. Uh, because not only could they potentially do harm to the employees around them, but also the, the risk of property damage and real catastrophic loss. So normally always equipment operators are going to fall into that category where drug testing should almost always be done. The last of the three provisions was talking about incentive programs. Now, as far as incentive programs go, OSHA has always disliked incentive programs that reward for zero accidents or for zero recordables. However, it was never a regulation or something they could enforce. It was just something that they had frowned upon. Now, in this case, with this change of regulation, these are actually going to be considered a violation of the rule if an incentive program is in place that is based on zero accidents or no recordables. Uh, they define it as really any program that takes adverse action against employees who report an injury was seen as a violation. So the goal is to refocus incentive programs on proactive safety behaviors rather than reactive. So whether or not injuries occurred or whether or not injuries were reported. OSHA is hoping with the new incentive programs that it's going to encourage safe work practices and promote worker participation. So some examples that they gave of incentive programs that they would consider to not be a violation would be uh, rewarding for identifying hazards, uh, participating in investigations, submitting safety suggestions, reporting near misses, completion of training, compliance with rules. So if you were to do a walk around the facility and reward everybody if they were all wearing their personal protective equipment or something along those lines, that would be considered a proactive safety incentive program. Now, from a temp staffing perspective, typically uh, you're not going to be the one administering this program. I know there are some companies that do. So if you do, you want to make sure that you're also looking at your program. But in most cases, it's going to be your actual clients that are administering it. So again, it would be a good time to educate your clients that do have similar programs like this in place to let them know that this is a violation under the current OSHA regulations and hopefully work towards moving the program into a little bit more of a proactive realm. A couple other examples that they provided with the new information release. Um, incentive programs for no lost time injuries are also a violation. Initially, when the information, when the information on the new rule came out, <clears throat> the idea was that it was only going to be a violation if it was based on no injuries or no recordables, and that no lost time injuries would be okay. Because the idea with no lost time injuries is you're not necessarily punishing anyone for being injured, but you're trying to reward people for getting back to work sooner or for modified duty. But because there are some cases where employees can't necessarily get back to work or that modified duty isn't an option just because of whatever their restrictions are, this would also be considered a violation of that rule. Um, if it's tied to violation of safety rules, there has to be evidence that the rule is always enforced. So again, really an underlying factor in all of these different provisions that were included as part of the injury deterrence is that consistency is key. And not to mention, when you come to consistency, you're also looking at documentation. So if there's a rule that is enforced, it should be enforced all the time and there should be documentation of it, whether or not an injury occurred. The other item that they specifically pointed out is that if there are incentive programs based on completion of safety training, that you can hold back the incentive if an employee misses training due to being out for an injury. So let's say that the incentive is that there's a drawing for a gift card every month that 100% of employees show up on time and complete their safety training. If somebody is out due to an injury, again, they can't be on modified duty, they're just off of work for that particular time frame when the training is held. Even though they're missing it because of an injury, because the main part of the incentive is based on completion of training, then you would still be okay to hold back the incentive. Some frequently asked questions on the injury reporting deterrence. Um, probably the most common is, wasn't it already a violation to deter and retaliate against injury reporting? And the answer to that is yes. It's always been part of OSHA's regulations that you can't deter an injury or an employee from reporting an injury, you can't retaliate against them. However, the previous rule was 
that if employee had to actually complain directly to OSHA within 30 days, and then they could open an investigation into potential retaliation. Under this new rule, it's a standalone violation. So if OSHA is on site based on an employee complaint or because of a response to an accident, they would be able to look at these policies as part of that visit and potentially issue a violation even if there hasn't already been a specific complaint. Again, these new rules were effective August 1st. Um, they were supposed to be effective August 10th, but they were pushed back because of that court case. But they have been now active for, give or take, four or five months. Some additional items to consider. Um, OSHA is part of the Department of Labor, which is part of the federal government, meaning that OSHA has a unique spin with every president that's in office. In this case, there has been a lot of talk that with President Trump that there may be some repealing of these particular changes. I know there was another rule that he already was successful in getting repealed regarding how long someone can be cited for not keeping accurate OSHA logs. So the idea is that he may jump in, particularly for this. But as of right now, there hasn't been any talk about the time frame for that. So still business as usual until we hear otherwise. Uh, some states have their own OSHA programs. So probably the most famous would be California has Cal OSHA. Now with the state run OSHA programs, they have uh, essentially everything has to be the same as federal government. They can just put more stringent requirements in place. So federal government is a bare minimum and then anything on top of that, they can do in an individual state program. When these changes were effective on a federal level, any change that happens to OSHA on a federal level, state programs have up to six months to adopt the changes, but they could implement sooner. So anytime you're looking at a deadline for that federal puts out, which is the deadlines that we talked about in this case, it could be further depending on if you're in a state with a state run OSHA. So it's something to look at if you are in one of those states. So quick summary, again, any location with 250 plus employees or ones with 20 to 249 in a high hazard industry will need to submit their OSHA data by July 2017, so July 1st this year. Any information um, after that will be required annually moving forward, again, July 1st again in 2018 and then March 2nd every year after that. A current ISTA law poster should be posted, whether as a standalone poster or as part of your overall poster package. Policies such as discipline, post-accident drug testing and incentive programs should be looked at not only your policies, but also your client policies that you're aware of to make sure that they are within the current regulations and aren't discouraging injury reporting. And then of course, as any more information comes out, it'll be available on, on OSHA's website as well as distributed. Any questions from the group? Okay, I have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first question, it looks like you may have answered, but it was um, a question relating to the Trump administration and if any of the repeals um, could happen to the new administration. I do think that this is something that he will look at to repeal uh, just because there has been a lot of negative feedback from different administration, industry associations, as well as employer associations. So I think, you know, everyone knows that Trump is very pro-business. I think this will be something that he may look at. I do not think it'll happen before that July 1st deadline. I don't necessarily know if it'll happen even before the end of this year. So I do think that the July 1st deadline will still come in as promised, but I do think it's something he may try to look at doing down the road. Okay. Another question, how does the electronic reporting rule affect staffing agencies with on-site personnel? So with on-site, um, the rule for record keeping as a rule of thumb is day-to-day -day supervision. In most cases, the reason I say in 99% of cases that staffing companies won't have to maintain logs for the temp employees is because in most cases, the on-site person is only really performing HR functions. So it's going to be, you know, making, getting attendance, maybe doing walkthroughs, making sure they're wearing the appropriate PPE, things like that. Not necessarily that they're actually going out and saying, okay, today we're short on product A, I need you to work on B, here's exactly the methods and processes to do it. 
if you have an on-site that's actually directing work to that level where they're choosing what products made, what the processes are, um, and monitoring that on a regular basis, then you may actually fall into that where you're performing day-to-day -day supervision, but in most cases you never are. So even if you have an on-site, uh, the temporary employees would still fall under your client's OSHA log and they would still need to report them as part of theirs. Okay, so kind of a follow-up question to that. So whose responsibility is it to have the temp off-site employee fill out an accident incident report, the host company or the temp agency? So it depends on, I guess when you're talking about the, the accident incident report, it's going to depend a little bit. So if it's, I'm assuming when you're saying an off-site employee, you're talking about somebody from your specific agency like who's going to, to fill that out, or there's two different types of forms, right? So when you're looking at the actual claim reporting, the first board of injury form, that's going to be something on you because you're responsible from them from an insurance or a work comp perspective. Um, as far as the OSHA's definition of like the 301, the accident report that's required for every injury on their log, that's going to fall under the host employer that they have to have that completed. Okay. Does that, just hopefully that answers that. <laughs> Yep, it looks like it did, I gotta thank you. So, okay, great. Um, is there a specific list of the types of in incidents that can or cannot have a post-accident drug test? Unfortunately, no. When the, when the rule came out, this was probably one of the more commonly asked questions is that, and I think just as an overhaul of humans, we want things to be you know, as clear as possible. And unfortunately, OSHA did not make it so when they released this guidance. So there isn't a specific list of, you know, these are the types of accidents you can drug test for, these are the ones you can't. The only example they gave of ones that you normally cannot at all is going to be, again, insect bites and repetitive motion. But other than that, it's going to be really using your best judgment based on the specific details of that incident. Okay, can you tell me if OSHA has already started citing for these changes? So far, we haven't seen anything. Um, with OSHA, normally you see that once a new rule or regulation comes out, they do tend to be a little slow to actually start enforcing it, uh, whether or not it's because they're actually giving everyone a, a little bit of a leeway to get these programs in place, or if it's because they're not necessarily up to speed on what they should be looking for. I know we saw this with the Temp Work Initiative. So the Temp Work Initiative became effective in 2013, and it wasn't really, and it was towards the front half of 2013, and you really didn't see a lot of staffing companies getting citations for items at their host employer sites until late 2014, and it's really picked up since then. So in a lot of cases, you will see there's a little bit of a time frame. I haven't seen anybody get cited for it thus, thus far, not saying that nobody has, but it hasn't been a big focus from what we've seen. Okay, great. If anyone else has any questions, please go ahead and submit them now using the chat or the Q&A feature. I have also just opened up an exit poll. If anyone um, can please give us your feedback on today's session um, or any ideas on future topics that you'd like to hear. It always helps us for our planning purposes. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today, Lauren, um, as takeaways before we uh, end the session today? Oh, no, if anybody has any specific questions about um, how it affects. Lauren, are you there? Lauren? Looks like we may have lost our audio. Yeah, somehow we lost Lauren. So this is Kurt with Assurance. I think what Lauren was going to say is if anybody has specific questions related to anything Lauren covered in the um, session today, please feel free to reach out to Tricom or Lauren directly, and we will make sure to address those specific uh, questions that you have. And I, we know a lot of times things come up later in conversation with people internally or externally. You said, geez, I wish I would have had the opportunity to ask. Feel free to ask us at any point. Absolutely. I've gone ahead and have Lauren's contact information here on the screen, so her phone number and email address as well as a website, and, and Kurt um, with Assurance is also available as a great resource um, for anyone that has additional questions. So thank you for jumping on uh, here at the end. Uh, 
So I'd like to wrap things up today. It doesn't look like we have any additional questions that have come in yet, um, but I'd like to thank our participants in today's webinar, as well as um, Lauren and Kurt um, for presenting for us today from Assurance on the topic of OSHA's electronic reporting and anti-retaliation changes for staffing. A recording of the webinar will be available on our website at trecom.com. It's underneath the Resources and Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Thank you.